Hey, this is Tony from Adafruit, and in this video we're going to look at an interesting thing you can do with CircuitPython using the module called Pulse I.O. or Pulse Input Output. And basically this is a module that lets you do kind of high frequency analog uh, inputs and outputs, things that can drive like an LED, uh, so you can PWM or control kind of the brightness of an LED using this. But the really cool thing that you can do with this is clone and emulate a remote control. So for example, I have one of these little uh, kind of fake LED candles, and these are pretty neat. Uh, you know, you turn them on and it starts to glow out. You might be able to tell this is glowing. It's so bright in this room that it's, uh, it's hard to see. But basically it has this remote control. So if I press the off button, it turns it off. So you can see it kind of uh, gets a little bit darker. And then I can turn it on by pressing this button here. Uh, and so that's kind of neat in that there's a little infrared uh, LED inside of there that you can see inside the remote. So when I press one of the buttons on here, it's sending a signal through that little LED to a receiver that's built into the candle right here. And it's actually pretty interesting how this works. And we're going to look at this at a very low level and see how to read the signal coming out of the IR LED from this remote control and play it back on our own infrared LED from a circuit Python board so that we can actually turn this candle on and off um, using circuit Python code and some hardware that we build ourselves. And you could extend this to any kind of infrared control device like a television, a robot, um, you know, I don't know, a stereo equipment, something like that. Um, you know, maybe uh, uh, I think the Apple iPod, uh, different uh, stereos and things like that. I don't know, I'm trying to think of things that, that use infrared these days and everything's smartphone now. So unfortunately, IR is kind of going away. But there are still interesting cases, especially like if you want to turn off all the TVs, you can uh, read all of the television codes and then just with a little infrared LED, start sending those uh, signals. And I remember there's some people that got in a lot of trouble at CES one time because they built some hardware, they were using TV Be Gone, they're turning all the TVs off at this big electronics trade show. So don't do that, you might, uh, you might get in trouble, but you can learn how to do that potentially with uh, the info in this video. So let's get started. Let's see, let me make sure this thing is turned off. Uh, we'll dive right into this and I'll show you, I'll walk through, again, we're going to do this with CircuitPython and you have to use CircuitPython for this. Uh, we're using this Pulse IO module that's specific to CircuitPython, uh, something we're building because in the future, some of the boards we have uh, will use some of the interesting capabilities that Pul Pulse IO has. Uh, so we're, you need a CircuitPython board to get started. The Feather M0 Express board is probably the best board to use right now for this. Uh, it's in the shop right now and it's a really handy board. So we'll dive in and I'll kind of walk through uh, the hardware and then we're just going to actually uh, build this in the REPL so there won't actually be any source code right now. Uh, but eventually there's going to be a little library that we'll have that will simplify a lot of this infrared uh, remote control stuff. So let's take a look at uh, some more details here of what's going to happen. So. Uh, what I have, like I mentioned, uh, I have an infrared remote controlled device. So it's this little LED candle. Uh, I just found this, I think, at a Costco or something for like a four pack of these for like 10 bucks or something. You can find these everywhere now. Um, and again, it has a little remote control here, you can see, and this is the world's simplest remote. It has an on and off button. Um, if you don't have a remote, there is actually a nice one we have in the shop. Um, this one right here, I'll put a link in the description when this goes up on YouTube to all of the hardware that I'm showing and all of the web pages that I show. Uh, this is a nice little generic one that just has like uh, numbers. I think this is meant for like controlling, you know, like a media player or something like that. Uh, but again, this is, you know, it has a little infrared uh, LED inside of there. And when you press the buttons, it will send commands using that. So you don't even need to like, you know, use an existing device. You could just read from a remote that you get like this. Uh, again, any, any remote control that you have should work. Uh, so grab one. Uh, and the way that these work, again, like I was mentioning, there's a little infrared LED, and I happen to have an LED right here that this is an infrared LED, uh, which you can also pick up in the shop right here. So you're going to need an infrared LED because what we're going to do is we're going to build our own version of a remote control using this Feather M0 Express board. So that's the board right here, and it's running CircuitPython. So what we'll do, so you're going to need this LED, obviously, because you'll need to create infrared light. And again, infrared light is light that you can't see yourself. So, you know, we might actually see it when I press um, this. Oh, you don't see it. So some cameras don't filter out the infrared light uh, so that when you look at an infrared remote control on a camera, and maybe if I hold this really close to this camera, we well, might be able to see it kind of flicker when I press it on. Let's see if we see anything. No, I don't see anything there. Let's see if this GoPro filters it out. This is kind of an interesting test. 
no, nope, I don't see it there either. But sometimes if you hold this up to like maybe your cell phone, if you look through uh, your cell phone camera app and then press some of the buttons on a remote control, you might see like little flashes of light. Uh, but to the human eye, I can't see anything when I look at this uh, because it's at a wavelength of light that's, uh, I think it's lower than what we can actually see normally. So it's invisible to us, but it's just electromagnetic radiation. It's just like the light that's lighting me up right now, just at a different uh, uh, frequency. So uh, by using that though, it's kind of nice in that, you know, I, I can press these buttons, I won't see it, but other hardware can pick it up. And that other hardware is something like this. So this is a little infrared receiver module. And uh, oops, so oh, actually I was showing the wrong thing. This is the infrared LED. So I'll put a link to this uh, in the description when this is on YouTube. But this is the receiver. And so you'll need to get one of these also. So again, you'll need the receiver and the LED right here to build this. So those are two things. Maybe here we'll zoom out a little bit, but I can't zoom out too much because my uh, desk is very messy and I don't have a ton of room here. But anyways, uh, here is, so there's the receiver, there's the LED, there's the circuit Python board um, that I have here. Now the receiver, this is actually kind of special and this gets into the way remote controls work. Um, they use infrared light, but they don't just turn it on and then turn it off. They actually turn it on and off at a very specific frequency. And it actually, I think it mentions in the page right here. So yeah, it's tuned to 38 kilohertz. So the way that most remote controls work, or at least as all of them that I know uh, work, is that they send data using a 38 kilohertz signal so that when it's on, it's actually not just turning that LED on, you know, like this light turns on and it's boom, it's on. It's actually turning it on and off at a rate of 38,000 times a second. So th this receiver actually filters that out and it's actually a really handy device. So there are three pins on it. Uh, the rightmost pin is power, the uh, five volts you wanna send into it. The middle pin is ground and the left pin is a signal pin, which is kind of your receive pin or actually I'll put it here so you can actually see the, the pins here. And what happens is when this receiver detects an infrared 38 kilohertz signal then it will actually, it will set this signal pin low. So normally it sets it at a high level when it detects some kind of pulse of infrared light at 38 kilohertz, and it, it's gotta be pretty much exactly 38 kilohertz, then it will set this low. And then what you can do to actually send data over that signal is control how long that pulse is on or off. So it's that 38 kilohertz, 38,000 times a second pulse. And let's say we keep it on for I don't know, nine milliseconds. And then let's say we turn it off for four milliseconds. So I could have you know code that's looking at the output of this IR receiver and it looks to see, okay, do I see on for nine milliseconds and then off for four milliseconds? Oh, maybe that tells me something sent me that signal you know, using that very specific uh, timing information. And that's actually what's happening when I press the buttons on this remote control it's sending a 38, 38 kilohertz signal and it's turning that signal on and off for a certain window of time depending on the data that it's trying to send. And you can actually get really advanced and I'll put a link to this uh, in the description when this goes on YouTube. This is a page that explains the NEC infrared transmission protocol, which is one of the protocols that infrared remote controls can use. There's actually tons of different protocols. Uh, pretty much every vendor like Sony has their own, uh, has their own protocol, but this is a really common one and it is, it's this protocol that this remote happens to use. Uh, and so you can kind of see, you know, using that 38 kilohertz infrared signal, again, 38 kilohertz right here, uh, it can represent a zero or a one bit just based on turning that 38 kilohertz signal on for a period of time and then off for a period of time. So a zero bit is uh, mentioned right here. So if you have a pulse where it's 38 kilohertz infrared uh, that's pulsed for 562.5 microseconds and then that's followed by 562.5 microseconds where it's off and they call it kind of a mark or a space, then that gives you a zero bit. And then for a one bit you do again 562 millis microseconds uh, on and then 1.68 milliseconds or basically double 562 microseconds off. So you basically you're off twice as long as you're on in that case. And that sends a logical one or a one bit. So you have a way to send zeros and ones 
you can just add a bunch of those up and suddenly you have a way to send bytes and then you know you can send multiple bytes and you have a way to send commands with this and so this gets into more of the protocol as far as it actually can send a byte with an address and a byte with a command but we won't really get too far into those details i mean the important thing here to understand is just that there's a signal that's being sent using infrared light and that signal is uh, modulated 38,000 times a second. They do that because it helps uh, reduce noise because all of the different things in this room, like these big LED lights that are lighting me up right now, they're actually producing some infrared light themselves. You know, Even the sun, if I open the window, uh, that's gonna have a ton of infrared light that's gonna be hitting me. And so that, that would, you know, if I was just looking for a pure, uh, you know, is the IR light on or off? then everything in my room is gonna mess with that. So by filtering things out so that we only look for light that turns on and off 38,000 times a second, that's a pretty unique frequency. You know, There's nothing in nature that's gonna turn itself on and off 38,000 times a second, at least hopefully not, or if there is, then I don't know, maybe there's some alien technology coming in, or who knows, there's probably some black hole out in the universe somewhere that's modulated 38,000 times a second, and that will probably screw everything up. But uh, you know, in most parts of nature, there's nothing that operates that frequency. And so that, by, by using that frequency then, it helps just reject everything. So this receiver can be a little bit uh, smarter. So you know, if, if it only looks for stuff that changes 38,000 times a second, it's not gonna get confused by all the other light in the room. You know, it's only gonna see things that are man-made that are generating pulses at that 38,000 times a second. Um, okay, so that's kind of some of the theory we'll get into some of the practicalities of how to make this work. So like I mentioned, you need the infrared receiver, uh, which is this guy right here. And then you also need an LED, the infrared LED, uh, this guy right here. And then you also need a resistor uh, because when you wire up an LED, uh, you want to limit the current through it or else you might blow it out or you might damage your inputs. Uh, and so this is a 220 ohm resistor any resistor value from like 150 to like 500 ohms is okay. The higher the resistance, the less your infrared LED is gonna light up. And so that's maybe the less distance you'll get. Uh, and for these LEDs, uh, they actually can handle a lot of current, but your board can only source so much current. So stick with around like 200 uh, ohms or so. That's a safe value. You can get brighter if you use like a transistor or a MOSFET or something. I think the product page mentions, yeah, you can you can do high power. They can take up to an amp or so of current. That's a lot of uh, current to dump into an infrared LED, uh, but that would maybe let you turn things off, you know, across the room or, uh, you know, maybe even turn off your neighbor's TV or something with that. Anyway, so we're just doing something simple here. Uh, okay, so to wire this up, first let's just look at some of that theory that I mentioned. So uh, I'm going to take the uh, infrared receiver, and like I mentioned, there are three pins on it. Uh, oh, and it, it has kind of a certain look to it. So if I hold it up here uh, to the camera, and we'll see if it kind of focuses uh, slowly, kind of focusing. You can see how it has like a bump on the front of it. Uh, you see that kind of curved surface, oops, that kind of goes out to the front there. So that bump is the, the front of it. And so, you know, facing me is the way that that bump um, should go. And so when it's facing me, the rightmost pin is the power pin, the middle one is ground, and the leftmost is signal. So it's uh, you want to be careful to hook this up the right way to your board. So I'm going to plug this into a breadboard, and that rightmost pin I'm going to hook up to 5 volt power, which again, this is the Feather M0 Express board running CircuitPython. Um, I'll put a link in the description below to CircuitPython, so you need to get CircuitPython running on this board ahead of time before you start this. Um, but the way to wire this up, so for power, for five volts power on the Feather, because I have this plugged into the USB line, uh, then I'm gonna use the V USB output, which is uh, the third pin on this side. So one, two, three. So basically this is just gonna give me the direct USB power output, which is five volts. Uh, I can't remember if these sensors work off of three volts also, 3.3 volts. Um, you might check the product page here and see um, if they do. Uh, the other option would be like if you're using like an Arduino Zero or uh, pretty soon, or actually as of this week, the uh, Metro M0 you could use also. And so that gives you a five volt output. So use your board, board's five volt output. Okay, middle pin is ground. So obviously I need to hook that up to ground. And on the feather boards, it is the fourth pin on this side. So I'll plug that in. 
And then the signal pin, this last pin right here, this needs to be hooked up to any uh, digital input. So I'm gonna hook this up to digital pin number six on my board, which happens to be, uh, I'm looking at it upside down, so it is this pin right here. Um, okay, and then I'm gonna do something interesting. Uh, I'm actually gonna wire up just a red LED to the output of this um, uh, IR sensor because we can just kind of visualize, we can see the output of this thing. And then as I press buttons on the remote, you'll just see that something happens, like it, that, that it changes its signal a little bit. Uh, so what I'm gonna do for this is I'm going to hook up, uh, this is my resistor, this is that 220 ohm resistor. And I'm gonna put one leg of the resistor to the ground connection, that's the middle one, or you could just run a separate wire to the ground of the board if you wanted um, for this. Oops, let me move this out of my way so I can see this. Um, okay, so, oh, and I just uh, I shorted it out against uh, the power, so that, that uh, might have upset the board a little bit, but it's fine. Um, okay, so I, so I connected one leg of that resistor to ground, and then the other leg of this I'm gonna connect to uh, the cathode of this LED, this red LED, and so the cathode is the shorter leg. So you wanna connect the shorter leg, this one right here, to the other side of that resistor. And then the longer leg, the anode of it, I'm gonna connect, uh, well, for this, I'm actually just gonna connect it to um, the signal output of the uh, IR receiver. So that's that uh, leftmost pin right here. So, okay, so I do that, and notice the LED turned on. And so that's because when this receiver is not detecting anything, it pulls itself up to a high logic level. Uh, so it's giving kind of five volts out there. Now, when I press one of these buttons, watch the LED and let's see what happens here. So I'll press a button on the remote and you can see it, it kind of flickered for a second. Uh, like I'll press the off button and you can see it flickers, you know, press on, off, on, off. So what you're seeing there is when I press this remote, it's generating a 38 kilohertz infrared signal and it's turning it on for a certain period of time, off for a certain period of time, on for a certain period of time, off for a certain period of time. And every time it turns it on, this LED turns off. And then when it turns it back, uh, when it turns it off, when, when there's no 38 kilohertz infrared signal, it turns on again. So the, the LED is inverted effectively. So it's, it's on whenever there's no 38 kilohertz pulse and it's off when there is a 38 kilohertz pulse. And so what you're actually seeing, you know, when I press this button here and send it uh, a command and you see those little flickers there, you're, you're seeing actually this signal, this kind of train of pulses. And so whenever it's green right here, that just means there's a 38 kilohertz signal being sent. And then whenever it's not green, there's no signal being sent and the LED is turned on. So when it's green, the LED is off, and when it's, uh, when, there's, when it's white right here, it's on. And you know, it happens pretty quickly because this time, you know, there's nine milliseconds, four milliseconds, and then you know, just a few microseconds for some of the bits. So you, there's not a lot you can really tell right now from your eye, but you can see that it happens, uh, you know, that it is turning on and off and, and things are happening. You can actually see the candles kind of turning on and off too here for this. So I, yeah, you can kind of see, okay, right, the candle turns on, candle turns off for that. Okay, so again, just trying to show kind of the theory of how these infrared receivers um, work for this. So now let's see how to read this from CircuitPython. So let's go in and I'm gonna connect to my CircuitPython board. So I have my Feather M0 Express. It's got CircuitPython loaded on it already. And again, look in the description below. Uh, I'll put a link to a, the, the CircuitPython guide for this um, board. So it tells you how to load CircuitPython and get started. Uh, and I'm going to connect to my board's serial terminal at 11.5200 baud. And I'm just gonna press something to get out of the auto reset mode. Um, and I'm at the REPL now, so I can run Python code. So you know, make sure you can get to this point. Um, and again, you have to use CircuitPython for this because we're gonna use libraries that are only in CircuitPython. Um, okay, so let's get the code going to read a signal from this IR receiver, because what we need to do now is read this train of pulses that's gonna be coming out the output of our IR receiver. So that's what's flickering the LED. I, you know, if I can read that from my CircuitPython board, if I can read how long is that signal on versus off, then I'll be able to tell, you know, what's being sent. And if I can save that and play it back, then I've got control over it. I basically, I've effectively cloned this remote control. Uh, so that's what we're gonna do. So the first thing we need to do is read this signal. 
So let's take a look then at what we want to do. So there are two modules that we need to use. We need to use the board module to access the pins on here. So I'm going to import board. And then we're going to import the pulse IO modules. That's what I started talking about uh, at the very beginning here. And this is a module, um, if you're familiar with CircuitPython, this is actually somewhat new. So you do need to be using the most recent version of CircuitPython. Uh, we basically broke out a lot of the analog uh, writing and reading. So things like um, you know, sending a PWM signal, we put that into this pulse input and output module uh, because we wanted to group together a lot of the similar concepts and things and, and break it apart so that you know some boards support analog uh, outputs and PWMs and things like that. Some boards don't, and so uh, this you know this board happens to support this. Anyways, uh, the pulse I/O module is what I want to import, and I'll put a link to the description for CircuitPython's API reference. So this goes into details here about the Pulse IO module and what's inside of here. And there are three classes. There's a Pulse input, a Pulse output, and a PWM output class. And we'll look at all three of these actually in this video. We're gonna start with the Pulse input class. And so what this does is this will look at a pin and it will read a train of pulses. So it will look for when that pin goes from high to low and it will actually record how long it was in each state. So you can basically tell it, okay, you know, create a pulse input on this pin and save, you know, up to a hundred changes. And a change is just when the pin goes from high to low or back. Uh, and so it will it will store, okay, how many the last hundred times I saw this pin change from high to low or vice versa, and it actually stores for each time, uh, for each moment, how long the pin was in that state. So it will record how long was the pin you know, held at a high level, and then it went down to a low level, and how long did it stay at that low level? And then it jumped back to a high level, and high, how long did it stay at that high level? And that's exactly what I need to be able to read this signal that's being sent, because I need to read how long is it at this high signal here? You know, Is it high for nine milliseconds like the protocol shows? And then is it low for four and a half milliseconds? And again, remember, it's not actually the remote, uh, the IR LED that's on for nine milliseconds and off for four and a half milliseconds. It's actually that 38 kilohertz signal that it's generating. So that's turned on, it's you know 38 kilohertz signal for nine milliseconds and then nothing. And then 38 kilohertz signal for you know a few milliseconds or so. And you know, so the detector is detecting that signal and then the detector is kind of averaging that out and giving me just an on or off whenever it detects that 38 kilohertz signal. Okay, so pulse input is what we need to use here, and we'll we'll create an instance of this pulse input um, class. So it's pretty simple to use, and we'll say our ir uh, read equals the pulse io module dot pulse in, and it takes a few parameters. It needs to know the pin that you're trying to read from. So in this case, it's the digital input number six, uh, which is what I have connected to my ir receiver in this case. Um, and then you also need to give it the length, the maximum length, which is how many changes it can store. And so this is basically like how long do you want it to, how much history do you want it to have for this train of pulses? Um, and this kind of depends on what you're trying to read. For remote controls, um, a value of 100 is probably fine. So this is going to store 100 changes. So every time this goes from a high to low signal, that's a change. So this will store the last 100 that it saw. And it, it, for each of those changes, it stores how long it was in that state. So this is just basically, you know, how long of a signal can you record um, effectively? And I only need to store about 100. You know, the more you, the higher you set this, the more memory it's going to consume. So you do want to be careful about how you tune this. Um, and then there is an idle state parameter. And this is just telling uh, the pulse input class what's the default value for this signal? You know, is it normally at a high level or is it normally at a low level? And as you can see with this LED, it's normally at a high level. So when there's no special 38 kilohertz signal being sent, it's staying up at a high level. And then when there is a signal, it falls down to a low level. So it's kind of inverted in some ways. Um, so I'm gonna say the idle state of this is true. And so that just helps me to interpret the, the pulse value so that it, it knows that you know a train of uh, a pulse starts when it when the, the signal drops down to a low level, when it's not in the idle state anymore, then it needs to start recording the next hundred pulses and changes that it sees there. Um, okay, so I do that. And then uh, what this is effectively is this is just an array of a hundred points in time or a hundred uh, changes. 
And for each of the int values, it's the, the amount of milliseconds that the signal was high or low. And so I can actually look at the length of this. If I look at the length of my IR read object, it says zero. And that's because it hasn't detected any change yet. So there's, you know, this signal has stayed at a high level. It hasn't seen it drop down to a low level yet. Um, so there's no pulse that's been sent to it yet. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to press the on button and I'm, you know, I'm careful to aim my remote control. Maybe if I move this a little bit out of the way, you can see. So I'm going to, you know, uh, put the remote right in front of, uh, and I'll put the candle behind this so that it'll hopefully pick this up. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to press the on button with it facing the IR receiver. And uh, now we see, so the LED or the candle just turned on. And now if I look at the length of this, I've got some stuff in here now. It has 75 values inside of this array. Uh, and I can look at all these values. So I look at IR read zero, this is gonna give me a value, IR read one, IR read two, so forth, so forth. And the value inside of here is the number of milliseconds that the, the pulse was at that level. And so for value zero, basically this is how long was it out of the initial non-idle state. So, you know, because I told it my idle state is true, once it drops down to a low level, a false level uh, for the digital input, then it starts counting. And so, you know, it will keep counting until it goes back up to a high level, the idle state. And it will save that value here in IR read zero. So this is telling me that I was at a low level for nine milliseconds effectively, or, you know, 9.028 uh, milliseconds. And that's a good sign because if I look at this NEC infrared protocol, it says the protocol starts with a nine millisecond leading pulse burst. Um, so that's what I see right here. I see nine milliseconds. Um, and then it's followed by a 4.5 millisecond space, which basically means uh, it's off. So in the remote protocols, they usually call it like a mark or a space. So it's on when it's a mark. So I see nine milliseconds off. And then the next value is about 4.5 milliseconds um, and you're never going to get an exact value because you know the timing of this remote control and the timing of the receiver might be a little bit so if you're trying if you're building code to compare these values you know you're never going to see exactly 9,000 milliseconds or exactly 4,500 milliseconds you're going to have to have like a little tolerance that you build in there like a fudge factor of like 10 percent plus or minus that you look at these but this is looking pretty good so i see you know, 4.5 milliseconds roughly uh, where it's off in, you know, the next part of this pulse train that it sees. And then the next value it sees is around 570 or so milliseconds, uh, or actually microseconds. Um, oh, and sorry, this is this is a value in microseconds. Uh, I, was, I, I misspoke earlier. I said this is milliseconds, it's actually microseconds. So, you know, 9,000 microseconds is nine milliseconds. Uh, so I see 570 microseconds inside of here. And that's a good signal because that's kind of telling me this is the start of one of these zero or one values. So if I look at the next value inside of here, I see about 603. So that's pretty close to 562 microseconds. So that looks like a zero bit is my initial value that was sent inside of here. So this will just keep going and going. So there are 75 values inside of here. If I look at that length again, uh, or actually oh, a few more. It looks like you know it received a little bit more uh, in the kind of interim there. You can actually pause this. If I call um, the irread.pause, it will stop reading and adding new pulses to this uh, this uh, pulse input here. But anyway, so if I look at the length of this, you know, uh, oh, actually I read some more there in the uh, interim. Um, but if I look at the length of this, you know, it, it's static now and it's it's stopped. Um, okay, so. If I, if I want to look at all of these values, I can print them all out if it's um, interesting. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to store these in an array. Because what I did was I effectively captured that on command um, you know, that I sent earlier. When I pressed on and we saw that initial 75 uh, values that were set here, that's stored right now in this uh, Pulse.io object. So let's copy this out into an array so that I, I keep that safe and then I don't ever lose that. And then I'll actually be able to play that back in a moment. Um, okay, so I'm gonna import the array module. And I'm doing this because the we're gonna use this pulse output class and it needs to take data in, in, a, in a Python array because it's actually calling into some C code internally and it's more efficient if we create an array object ahead of time uh, rather than using Python lists because a list in Python 
it's not an array like in the C sense. It's actually a linked list internally, and so it's not the most efficient thing for C code um, to use. Anyways, let's import the array module, and we'll say my on command equals. Uh, we're going to create an instance of the array class, and you can tell the array class what data type to use internally. So we're going to use this H value. This tells it to create an array of 16-bit values. Uh, which is just, it's important for this pulse uh, output class that we're going to look for in a second here. And then I need to tell it all of the values. I can, I can kind of preload it and say, okay, make an array of 16-bit integers, and here's all the values that you want to use to start with. Uh, and the way that I do that is I, I give it an iterable uh, value. I, I think I can actually give it, oh no, I can't give it the IR read uh, object itself because it doesn't implement the iterator interface. But what I can do is I can use this generator syntax. Uh, so this is a little bit advanced Python, but this is uh, basically I'm going to create a list on the fly and pass it into this array constructor. I'm going to create that list based on all the values in the IR read uh, object, the pulse input object uh, that we used before. So this syntax, just go with it for a second here and I'll explain uh, what I'm doing here. So I'm going to do IR read x, 4x in uh, the range of the length of IR read, and then we'll close that out. Okay, so what's happening here is this is a special syntax in Python where this is creating a list. So you can see square brackets, that makes a list in Python. But rather than listing all of the values inside of here, I'm telling it code to run to generate all these values. And so that code is basically a for loop. And so Python has some cool syntax where you can say, okay, you know, loop through the values, um, you know, loop through 4x in the range of values inside the length of that infrared receiver or that pulse IO object. So basically take the length of the pulse IO object and loop through all of the values in that length. So that's what this part is doing. And then it lets me run some code uh, for each of the values that it gets. Uh, and so I'm going to basically say, okay, pick the value inside the pulse IO uh, or inside that IR read object at that position. So this is basically just copying all of the values from my pulse IO object into this array. So it's using this kind of fancy syntax. Uh, it's this, uh, I think it's a list comprehension, if I remember correctly, is what they call it in Python. So I'm going to run this command. Uh, and what happens here, if I look at my on command now, this is an array. And it's nice, it's telling me it's an array object. Uh, this is the data type that it's using. And then here all the values are. And this is good. I can see the values match up with the values that we were looking at here. So the first value is that kind of 9,000 value. So you know 9,000 microseconds, then 4,500 microseconds, and then all of the other timing values that are inside of here. So this should be basically my on command um, that I've received, you know, that, that I recorded by pressing on and pointing it at that IR receiver. Okay, so now for some fun, um, let's see. Let's, I'm going to turn off my LED. I just want to make sure, or turn off my candle, so I just turned it off. Okay, let's hook up my infrared LED now. So I'm going to unplug my, um, my little red LED. That I was just using this to demonstrate again that, you know, what the output of that IR receiver looks like. Okay, and so let's use this infrared LED now. So I'm going to keep that resistor plugged up. Oh, I just reset my board, actually. That was a, I, uh, I have my, uh, my ground, my resistor, a little bit too close to the power uh, connection here. So uh, we're going to have to run through this R code again uh, real fast. But hey, this is uh, don't be like me. Uh, isolate your components so you don't short things out on accident. It's fine. The, limit, the current's going to be limited. It's not going to fry anything. Uh, but you know, be careful. Anyways, though, so to hook up this LED, uh, what I need to do is, so I have my resistor hooked up, you know, one leg of the resistor is connected to ground. Um, actually here, let's, eh, we'll keep it the same. I was thinking, let's, let's fix it, but let's, let's just keep charging through. Uh, so one leg of the resistor is connected to ground, and then the, uh, the uh, cathode of the resistor, so the shorter leg of the resistor, needs to be connected to the other side, or the, the shorter leg of the LED. So the cathode of the LED needs to be connected to the resistor. And then the anode of the LED, which is the longer leg, that needs to be connected to a digital input or output on your board. So in my case, I'm going to use, uh, how about digital number 11? I just need to make sure I get it plugged into the right spot. So yeah, there we go. 
Okay, so let me open a new terminal window because um, in Mac, when your terminal unexpectedly closes, the screen program doesn't like it. So let's open up our screen, our terminal again. Our board has reset itself because I accidentally shorted it out. Uh, so I'm just gonna run through real fast uh, the code that I did before, and we're gonna record uh, our pulse again. So this is maybe good uh, you know, feedback. You can see how to do this again. Uh, okay, so I need to create my IR uh, receiver and this is going to be a pulse input object and that's the digital six input the length is a hundred and the idle state is true okay and so if I look at the length of IR read got nothing and now I'm going to turn on my candle so I'm going to press the on button and then I'm going to look at the length and I've captured a train of pulses I'll pause my IR receiver um, just because, you know, we'll, we'll keep it fixed here. So it's not reading, you know, there must be something in my room that's sending some IR pulses periodically, uh, which is interesting. I mean, this is a way to kind of track down. There's some spy device in here potentially. Uh, okay, so now I want to copy this out into an array like I showed before. So we'll import the array module. And so my on command that I captured is going to be array.array. .array. This is a 16-bit array. And we're going to do that generator syntax or that list comprehension syntax again uh, to say the IR read x for x in the, uh, what was it, the range of the length of IR read. Um, and then we close that out. Okay, and then just to double check, let's look at our on command. And yeah, this is looking pretty good. Um, and in particular, it starts with that 9 millisecond pulse and then a 4.5 millisecond pulse and then a bunch of the zeros and ones for that command. Okay. So again, I've wired up my infrared LED. Um, so I've wired the anode, the longer leg, to a digital input or output, digital pin number 11 uh, on this board. And then the cathode of the LED, the shorter leg, is going through a 220 ohm resistor down to ground. And I'm careful not to short that out again. Uh, and so that's basically, you know, now if I can, if I turn digital pin number 11 on, this infrared LED will turn off, or turn on rather. Uh, if I turn digital, uh, pin number 11 off, it will turn the LED off. And if I turn it on and off 38,000 times a second, then I can start to generate some of those signals uh, that like this remote control generates. Because, you know, again, remember, it's not that I want to turn this infrared LED on for nine milliseconds and then off for nine milliseconds. Um, I need to turn it on with a signal that changes 38,000 times a second. And I need to turn that 38,000 or 38 kilohertz signal on for nine milliseconds and then turn it off for 4.5 milliseconds. Uh, and that's the start of this train of um, pulses here for this command. So I need to modulate this IR LED using a PWM output first. And then I need to control, you know, when it's modulated on versus off using this pulse output class that we're going to look at. So the first thing is you, and I'll, again, uh, look at the documentation for uh, CircuitPython and the pulse output and the PWM output class is what you want to look at. Uh, but the first thing I need to do is I need to create a PWM output for this infrared LED. So to do that, I'm going to create my, how about my, uh, we'll say my IR LED equals uh, the, from the pulse IO module, the PWM out class. Now this needs to be told what pin it's connected to. That, that's pin number 11. Um, and then there are a few other parameters I need to pass to this. So I need to tell it the frequency that this pulse width modulation signal is going to run at. And it's very specific for infrared stuff. I need to tell it 38 kilohertz or 38,000. So it's, it will generate a signal that changes 38,000 times a second. And then the duty cycle um, is another value that I need to set. And I just want to double check that I get the, uh, the right name for this. Uh, so it is duty underscore cycle is what I want to specify here. So the duty cycle is basically uh, how, what percent of time is this PWM signal on versus off? And in this case, it doesn't really matter like we're not modulating the duty cycle of this signal, at least of this 38 kilohertz signal. I just need a, a, a sine wave effectively that's on, that, that has a frequency of 38,000 uh, kilohertz or 38,000 uh, hertz. Uh, and it doesn't even have to be a sine wave, it can actually just be a square wave. Um, so in that case, to make a square wave, 
you need a 50% duty cycle. And the duty cycle value in CircuitPython is um, a, say, 16-bit value, if I remember correctly. But basically, the shorthand to say a 50% duty cycle is to take 2 to the power of 15. And so that will give you a 50% duty cycle. So basically, my PWM signal is going to be on and then off for equal amounts of times. And so if I you know, have that signal over and over and over, it's just going to look like a square wave that's just constantly changing at the frequency that I specified, which is 38 hertz or 38 kilohertz. So 38,000 times a second. Um, OK, so that makes my PWM output um, in this case. And it's actually kind of interesting. What I'll do is um, I'll hook this LED up again if I'm careful not to short this out. So I'm going to hook up both uh, the LEDs. Well, maybe I won't hook these up. I'm, uh, uh, I'll, I'll be careful here. Um, I'm just thinking if I want to do this or not uh, live on there. Well, let's let's just roll with it right now. We'll see if this works. I was thinking I'd hook up the red LED and we'd look and see if it turns on and off. But you know what? I'm going to be confident. I'm going to uh, see and, and we're, we're just going to try it and see how this works. Um, OK, so again, so to to start with the, the pulse output, I need to have a PWM object. And then once I have a PWM object, so think of the PWM object as like, you know, the low level, this is the, the carrier signal, that 38 kilohertz signal that now a higher level pulse output class will control how long it turns that carrier signal on versus off, um, given an array of timing values that are exactly like this, which we read from the pulse input class. Uh, and again, you know, check out the documentation for uh, CircuitPython. And so the pulse out class is now what I'm going to use here. And so this is a, a pretty straightforward class to use. So I'm going to make an IR send object, and this is going to be the pulse IO pulse out. And this needs to be told my uh, PWM object that I just created a second ago. So my IR LED PWM object is what this pulse out class is going to use. So when this pulse out class is given a list of these timing values that say, OK, you know, turn on for nine milliseconds, then it's going to generate, it's going to turn that PWM signal on uh, at whatever frequency it was configured for and whatever duty cycle it was configured for. It's going to turn that on for nine milliseconds. And then the next value um, that I tell this pulse output class, you know, could be 4.5 milliseconds. And it's going to turn off that, that PWM signal for 4.5 milliseconds. And it's going to go through the whole list of values that I sent to it. Um, OK, so that's what I do there. So I've now my IR send object is you know, built on top of that PWM object. And it's ready to take a list of timing values. So it's kind of the inverse of the pulse in object. So pulse in gives you a list of timing values. Pulse out has a send function where you need to send it not a list, but you need to send it an array. So an array like in the format that I've shown right here. So it has to be the 16-bit value. Uh, and it kind of mentions here in the documentation uh, that you know it needs to be in this special format. Um, but anyways, OK, so let me make sure my candle is turned off. Uh, OK, so I don't know if you can tell that's on and that's off. Uh, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to hold this in front of my infrared LED. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say IR underscore send. So my pulse out object, I'm going to call the send function on it. And we're going to give it that on command that we recorded earlier. So let's give it that thing. And now fingers crossed, if I got everything wired up correctly uh, and didn't mess something up, let's see what happens. So I'm going to do this. And hey, check that out. My candle just turned on. It might be a little bit hard to tell because it's kind of bright in this room. Um, you know, here maybe if I turn off some of the lights, uh, this will be the, you might be able to see a little bit better. So um, let's see if I turn this off now. Uh, this is a little bit better. Uh, I'm thinking if I, uh, well, well, I guess this is about as, as, as good as we can get here. But I'm gonna, I'll do this again. So I'll send the on command. It just turned on. So that's pretty cool. And you know what's happening here is this little infrared LED is being modulated 38,000 times a second. Um, but that modulation is controlled by this pulse output. So you know it's it's pulsing out a 38 kilohertz square wave effectively for uh, nine milliseconds, you know, the first value. And then it, it stops. It doesn't pulse out anything uh, for 4.5 milliseconds. And then it pulses out that 38 kilohertz square wave for 500 micro, 570 microseconds. 
and then it pulses out nothing for 500 microsec 540 or so uh, microseconds and then uh, it pulses it back again for 593 microseconds it, you know turns that 38 kilohertz signal on um, and you know it goes through all the values that we recorded here and it plays them back and that's effectively replaying this infrared remote control signal that we that's uh, kind of specified right here so the cool thing is like I didn't really even need to decode all of this data I'm just storing the raw timing values of you know we saw this infrared receiver um, it saw a 38 kilohertz signal turn on and off for some specified you know period of time circuit Python recorded that we saved it into that on command um, array right here and then using a pulse output that's connected to a PWM class that's driving an infrared LED, we're able to drive that infrared LED with a 38 kilohertz PWM signal and modulate it on and off uh, at the right timings that we recorded to turn this little candle on and off. So you could record any remote control using this. Uh, you know, if you've got any infrared remote controlled device in your house, this basic code um, that I've just walked through here, and this is only about like five or six lines of code, you could do and you could save the value that you receive from your remote you don't have to care about how to parse it or decode it really just save that value you know once i have this array value i could go like write this out to a file potentially uh, although you can't do that right now on this circuit python board because you can't write uh, from circuit python uh, because it can mess with your usb data uh, but in this case, you know, I, what I could do is I could just save this from the REPL if I wanted, for example, uh, into a file and then maybe save that file and copy it onto the board. In the future, we're going to look at ways to, to save some of this state. Uh, but anyways, you know, as long as I can persist this array value somewhere, uh, and even if, you know, if I just copy and paste it into a new, uh, new Atom window here and then, uh, you know, save this into a file that I load up later. Uh, oh, boy, come on, Atom. This thing is... Uh, a little bit slow to start up unfortunately uh, there we go you know so if I save these values and if I load them back up into my Python code later then that's the on command you know as long as I create that pulse output and that PWM object and I have my little infrared LED hooked up to it I can play back any remote control command uh, which is pretty cool and a pretty powerful thing I think for this so uh, now you know in, in practice though you probably don't need to get down to that low level uh, and that you know a lot of this code will probably be written for you ahead of time uh, especially in the next few weeks or so because uh, I'm working on a library actually that will simplify some of this infrared stuff uh, because again you know all of these protocols are somewhat standard like this NEC protocol uh, and so you know we'll have a library where you can just call a function to pass in okay what is the address value and what is the command value that you want to send uh, because a lot of these remote controls you know like especially the remote control that we have in the shop like this one uh, these are all kind of standard values so when you press these buttons it's just sending a special address value and a special command value so if you know those values then we'll have a library that will generate uh, those pulse output uh, timings and just automatically send them for you but if you have some unknown remote control you know some random device shows up and you want to be able to control some device and you have no idea what the protocol is using this low level timing is one way to do it uh, it's a pretty powerful kind of way to interact with devices so that's all i wanted to show um, in this video so if folks have questions maybe throw them into the chat uh, real fast we'll jump back to the main view and I don't see any questions, so I think I'll wrap up uh, the stream. So thanks a lot for watching. This is Tony from Adafruit. Uh, in this video, we looked at the Pulse I.O. module in CircuitPython. So this is a way to deal with pulse width modulation. You can kind of read signals that change from high to low values. And using the Pulse In and the Pulse Out class, we're able to read when a remote control which sends uh, a, an infrared signal at a certain kind of frequency, we're able to read that data, store it, and then play it back over an infrared LED to control a little device like a little candle here. So I hope you learned something in this video. Um, check out youtube.com slash Adafruit. You'll see this video and all kinds of other project videos. Check out twitch.tv slash Adafruit and you can see me stream these things live. I like to stream things usually every Friday. Uh, and if you like this stuff, if you're finding out useful info, uh, you know, click the like or the comment or the subscribe button. You know, let us know that this is good stuff, and we'll keep doing this kind of content. So until next time, this is Tony from Adafruit. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye.